Take a seat. It is my pleasure to introduce Bryce, who will be talking about May the, May the Cloud Be With You, Red Teaming GCP. I'll let him take it away. Oh, and real quickly, um, a slight announcement. We have a, uh, if you're doing the skydiving, um, see registration today at 1 p.m. to sign up for a time slot. Back to you. Thanks. Appreciate that. All right. I'm Bryce. This is my Twitter handle, TweakFox. So um, if you want the slides, I'll throw up a link to the slides right after um, this. So uh, check, it, check it out on Twitter. And then uh, we're going to be talking about GCP today, uh, just kind of going over the basics of how you would red team inside the environment, and then just some maybe like cool little nuances that you may or may not already know about on the platform. So who am I? I'm Bryce. Um, I used to work at Homeland. I used to lead the incident response and focus operations for the unclassified SOC. Um, so that's kind of like hunting down APTs. Um, then I worked at NSA for a while as a technical director up there over a very specific offensive unit. And uh, then I, uh, I worked at Adobe. I built a red team out for them, and specifically in their digital experience business unit located out in Utah. And that, that is where I physically reside now is uh, near Salt Lake City, Utah. So uh, great skiing out there. And then um, now I lead stage two security. Uh, we're just like a small boutique firm, like 25 people. And we do a lot of like pen testing and uh, tool dev and stuff like that. So, oh yeah. Also, I run B side Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm the head of that nonprofit. And so, anyways, if you guys want to come ski in March, it's usually pretty good still. <laughs> All right. So, GCP overview. Um, because it's only 25 minutes, I kind of ripped out most of the overview. So. This is a crash course in cloud. So, all right, if you're like an admin, you know, and you log into it via the website, that's kind of you logging into the management UI, right? So that's that console.cloud.google.com. Um, you know, if you're using the CLI type tools, you're going to talk directly to the control plane APIs. And anytime you're clicking anything inside the website for GCP, you know, that's just going to be calling the control plane APIs below it. And uh, as you create resources or services, um, you know, that's going to reach out to the data plane and spin those out. So if you have any type of automation processes or CI, CD pipeline, uh, that's generally just going to talk to the, the control plane APIs, the RESTful APIs there, which are then going to spin up the services in the data plane. And typical services in the data plane would be like a load balancer and then some type of compute, like a virtual machine, and then storage. And, um, you know, cloud providers are ever trying to dominate in this space, and they have an array of different uh, services that, you know, uh, it'd be hard to be an expert in all of them. But, uh, you know, most people are using the cloud just kind of at least are using these basics, right? All right, so let's just dig into the compute engine, which is kind of like virtual machines on the GCP platform. So uh, a vulnerability that's really interesting in the cloud space uh, is server-side request forgeries. So typically you would have a web application, and you would be... Uh, hosting that on a virtual machine. And let's say back in the day, this was inside a data center and you had a nice, thick, uh, internet-facing data center firewall. Uh, so, uh, you know, you could get to the web server, but you couldn't necessarily get to uh, any of the other surrounding servers inside the target network. Um, in this example here, we have an application where a user would typically request the slash app URI, and then they'd pass a Git parameter for b.jpg. And then the web app would process that request, say, oh, they want b.jpg, that's over here on this other server that's internal only. I'm going to make a request out to that, grab the content, and then feed it back to the user. So that's kind of the typical way that the web app would work. Now, if a web application wasn't checking inputs, uh, then it might be vulnerable to a server-side request forgery, where an attacker could replace the image, uh, the value there, and the Git parameter, to another server internal to the data center and uh, maybe retrieve back some type of data that they necessarily shouldn't be able to access. Like, for example, if there's like a monitoring server, maybe like a Nagios or something like that on the internal, maybe they could pull some type of stats page off that. Um, you know, you know, it's, it's, a, you know a, it's a vulnerability, but, you know, it's not going to lead to a full compromise of the whole data center typically, right? So fast forwarding to cloud, SSRFs in the cloud are deadly, right? So... Um, because when you spin up your VM in the cloud, the control plane needs a way to communicate certain data to the data plane about what it should be doing. So for example, like uh, 
When you boot a VM, maybe you want it to execute a boot script, right? Like run this bash script when you boot up. How, how is the control plane going to tell the data plane to do that? Uh, it's going to take that boot script, put it inside this metadata service, which is like a RESTful API that the VM can call out to. And when the VM initially boots, it's going to call out to that RESTful API that's internal only to it, kind of like a fabric IP, and, uh, and then it's going to run that bash script. So um, there is an RFC spec on metadata services, but each vendor's implementation of it uh, greatly varies from the RFC spec. Uh, but generally, it's always going to be on that 169.254.169.254 IP address. And, um, and big thing here is credentials for GCP services could be stored in that metadata service, which would be accessible via server-side request forgery vulnerability. Um, on GCP specifically, there's like a nice FQDN that just resolves to that 169 IP. On the other platforms, Azure and AWS, that, as far as I know, that doesn't exist. All right, but let's say you have a server-side request forgery in a web application, and it's running on top of the GCP platform, and you redirect it to go to the metadata service, you might see back an error message similar to this, like 403 forbidden. Okay, so why are you seeing 403 forbidden? That's because Google has implemented additional protections to prevent server-side request forgeries uh, vulnerabilities from being able to access the uh, metadata service. Namely, you have to set another HTTP header in order to access the metadata service. Um, so this applies to Azure and GCP uh, for most of the stuff you can query via their metadata services. It does not apply to AWS. There's no HTTP header on the AWS platform right now. So, you know, we're the attacker, and now we're sad because we can't get back the creds out of the metadata service to interact with the control plane. So there's kind of uh, this loophole in GCP, and, uh, you know, if you look up more docs about it, it says deprecated and will be, uh, you know, removed, but it still worked. I mean, I tried this last week, and it still works, right? So I don't know what their timeline is for deprecating it, but... Basically, if you use slash v1 beta 1, not all the same features are there, but most of the features you want are there, like the credentials, right? So, so, um, so you just call that, and then you don't need to pass the metadata he header, HTTP header, and now you're all happy as a panda. All right, so for example, here's a sweet lizard website, and in it, there's a request for like external image, and then the git pram the git parameter p, the value of that is some external um, JPEG stored in an S3 bucket somewhere. And so we'll just modify that so the git parameter p points to the metadata server's uh, FQDN, or you could do the 169.254 IP address, and then use the slash v1 beta 1 uh, with this URI. And what you're going to get returned back is this uh, bearer token right here, or access token. And this is what you're going to need to start authenticating to the GCP control plane with the same rights that the VM is running as inside of the cloud provider. Uh, so generally what you'll do is you'll take that access token right there, and then you'll query this Google APIs right here. And um, it's going to tell you, one, yeah, that token works. And, uh, and then two, it's also going to tell you the scope of the token. So this is like incredibly nice because it actually tells you what you can use the token to do, uh, like what the token can do inside of the GCP account. Versus on AWS, um, you might get access to a token, but then you kind of have to, a lot of times, blindly guess what it can access inside the environment. So um, if we try to use that token to like spin up another VM, it's going gonna, it's gonna to send us back this message by default, like insufficient, insufficient permissions. Um, so let's like look into why we, we don't have rights to that. If we go to the web management console, like an admin, and then we go over to the compute engine service, and we go to spin up a new VM, uh, we're going to see there's a block there for identity and API access. So one of the cool parts about GCP is you could actually specify what that access token inside the metadata service will have access to, um, which uh, is a little different than, than the way it operates on Azure and AWS. But, um, you know, the... Allow default access. Uh, if we can pick that, that's uh, not going to let us spin up VMs. We'll look at that more in a second. Uh, 
But we could also pick set access for each API, and that will let us kind of pick, like, hey, I want this box to be able to talk to BigQuery or some other GCP service. So by default, these are the services that you can query. Uh, you can see Compute Engine, is, it, that's disabled, so you cannot spin up more VMs if you still creds this way. And um, yeah, we'll come back around to this more in a second. So. And then there's also that middle box, full access. So if that was selected when the VM was spinning up, then yes, those credentials can totally be used to spin up more VMs inside the environment that are under the attacker's control. So, um, so it really depends on the permissions there that are set around the VM when they're booted up. Um, there's some scripts here on this GitHub for just those requests I showed you there. You don't really need to use them. Um, I just more put them there for documentation purposes. All right, cool. So let's look at storage, right? Ton of cloud storage breaches out there. This is just from a small six month period. We see names like Accenture, Verizon, Time Warner Cable, Dow Jones, DGI, all using storage account in cloud providers without properly securing them. So there's a cool project out there called buckets.grayhatwarfare.com uh, where they just go and index all these public buckets and you can search through them. I'm not sure on the legality of this, but it's a cool idea. Um, basically, in the cloud space, there's two permissions that you want to watch out for on the GCP and AWS platforms. All users means public, and all authenticated users sounds like only people in your GCP account would be able to get to the files or resources and objects in the buckets. But what that actually means is anybody who has any GCP account can get to the resources. So that tripped a lot of people up on the AWS platform specifically. The cloud providers have made changes in the last year or so to the, the interfaces for storage accounts to make it a lot harder for you to make objects public. So that, that is positive from a defense side, um, but you know, you'll still see stuff set up incorrectly. Generally speaking, uh, storage on GCP is pretty uniformed, right? It's storage.googleapis.com, then you have to have a globally unique bucket name, and then you'll have the object or file name here. Um, so you can set buckets listable. This is not a typo. The, the top does say like the Amazon S3 spec for the list. So that, that is the way GCP does that. And you could brute force for objects or bucket names uh, using a tool like GoBuster. Um, you know, just like you would on any web engagement. Okay, so one thing that I just wanted to highlight real quickly is if you spin up a VM and you use the default settings um, and you look under storage, it says by default you have read-only access to storage. So what, what does that actually mean? And what that means is uh, there's this concept in GCP of a project. And so almost everything in GCP is uh, segmented at the, the project level. Um, so you have like an organization, you'll want to create a folder underneath it, even if you don't use the folder. Um, and then you'll want to create projects underneath that folder. Um, so if you get the credentials out of the metadata service, and then there's a storage inside that same project, even if that requires authentication, you'll be able to read the objects in that storage account. So, so that's uh, a good way to expand access. Okay. We got a few minutes left, so I'm going to talk about Kubernetes. Um, basically, the scenario we got here is there's a, there's a container running a web app. It has some vulnerability in it that enables remote code execution. Um, for the demos, you might see in screenshots, I load up the Voodoo tool, which is kind of our cross-platform post-exploitation tool. And then we kind of see what damage could be done inside the cluster or how you would expand access from there. This is really um, looking at GKE, uh, Google, Google Kubernetes Engine specifically. Um, there's a lot of different Kubernetes implementations out there. And this is just kind of default setup as of, you know, 30 days ago. So, okay, cool. So if you exploit a web app and you're an attacker, how would you even know that you're inside a container? Um, one way is you could cat proc one C group. And you can see in the listings, if you can see the monitors, that it says, like, this is a kube pod, right? Um, you know, you off, if Docker's in use, you could ls the root, and generally you'll see that hidden file Docker environment. And then the other one is if you do a PS, a process list on the box, uh, you'll see that PID1 looks weird, right? It doesn't look like an init or launch D, which are typically some of the early processes that get started up on Linux systems. For like example, this would typically be a typical case where you'd see like a Flask web app, 
as PID1, so you know you're inside a container environment. Um, okay, so probably no secret here if you're familiar with Kubernetes, but um, there's a, the, uh, there's creds basically stored in this location right here on disk, so if you can read that, then you can start authenticating to the Kubernetes API. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the Kubernetes, the way it works uh, on GCP is it just creates instances um, under Compute Engine. So even if you get access to a container, by default, you can redirect and talk to the metadata service, just like we saw in the past example, grab those creds and start using them to talk at the GCP level. Um, so here's an example where we load up a Python script and we pull creds out of the metadata, get back that access token. Um, one thing that is kind of interesting is as part of the bootstrapping process on the GCP platform, um, there is a, a kube environment set inside the metadata service. So, um, so this is used when, uh, when uh, worker nodes are being bootstrapped or loaded initially, and uh, you can pull those credentials out of there. Now there's a little more work that you need to do here in order to be able to use those to talk to the, um, the Kubernetes API. And um, uh, you can check out the references on the bottom of this slide. And I will post the slides on my Twitter account for you guys. So, uh, but you, know, you, you go through a couple steps and then you can authenticate to the API and you know, uh, potentially spin up more pods inside the cluster. All right, another way you can expand access if you get access to a, to a container is, um, you know, by default, there's really no um, enforcement of network boundaries. Uh, you would have to implement something like ITSO or Cilium uh, inside the cluster to, to prevent that. So um, a compromised pod could talk to the kubelet service on these TCP ports. Um, so like, here's a Python script that I load up into memory only to scan for the port. And then another Python script where we would just access those uh, to list out what pods are running on the other worker nodes inside the cluster. Right. And then container security is really just Linux kernel security. And this is one thing that I think, you know, if you don't take anything else away from here that hopefully you'll take away is, uh, um, you know, there was a vulnerability earlier this year, the run C vulnerability, and that would allow you to break out of the container and get code running on the host. But um, the Dirty Cow exploit from a number of years ago would, would also do the same thing, which is typically an exploit used to prevest from user to root on a Linux system, um, but it, it would also have the capability to break you out of the container. Um, so container security is really just Linux kernel security, you could use a set comp or some other controls to try and prevent what kernel API calls can be called uh, from the container, but uh, yeah, for the most part. Um, like a common thing that you'll see a lot if you search for like Kubernetes hacking is after they gain some type of credentials, um, they'll talk to the API and then they'll deploy another, another, con another pod that has a container that will have the root file system mounted. Um, you know, this may or may not work in your target environment, depending on the security posture of it. And then another thing to just kind of be aware of from a high level is they're, they're constantly rolling features into Kubernetes. And most of that code is, is accessible via this API here. So, um, so some of that code is going to have vulnerabilities. And in 2018, there was a vulnerability in the API that would enable you to bypass all authentication and authorization. So basically, if you could just talk to the API for Kubernetes, you could um, do anything inside the cluster. Um, one thing that I haven't really seen this on engagement, but uh, technically, you have a, something that's managing the containers on the worker nodes, like Docker. So if you were to misconfigure it with an unprotected TCP socket, you could move laterally that way too. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about breaching the environments from server side, right, coming in from the internet. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, breaching from client side or, you know, trying to get access to either the engineers or the cloud admins' uh, laptops, right? So um, may or may not be applicable to you, but a lot of tech companies, they use Mac uh, endpoints. Um, there was a recent uh, 
vulnerability in uh, Excel for on Mac that would basically allow you to get code execution via an XLM macro. Um, so that, that just came out last month or this month. And then prior to that, um, you know, I don't know if you guys know Patrick Wardle, but he has, he has a lot of research up on his blog that's really good if you're interested in Mac exploitation, the blog's Objective-C. There's links in the references. But basically, if you can take advantage of a, of a vulnerability like the XML one or whatever, XLM one, uh, then you could get code execution on a laptop. And if you were to get code execution on a laptop and they were using the CLI for GCP, um, it would create this .config folder and then you'll see some files underneath that. And the files you'd see underneath that look like this, right? And uh, you know, the one that says access tokens.db looks pretty good. So if we start checking that out, we realize that's just an SQLite database. And if we extract the data out of there, we can get um, a token that will allow us to authenticate to uh, the GCP control plane in the context of whatever that admin can do from his laptop. Um, also to note, there is um, also inside that same database, uh, a list of the scope of what those credentials can access. So uh, that's, that's nice from an exploitation standpoint. You can see how valuable they are pretty quick. Um, and then another thing I just want to highlight is uh, cookies, right? Like a lot of the admins aren't even installing the CLIs on their laptops anymore. And I'll, I'll show you why in a second. But, uh, you know, they still authenticate using their browsers. Um, there's a cool technique, cookie crimes. If you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, but, uh, you know, you could export the cookies, replay them, or to jump into their browser sessions. So um, when you're inside GCP, and uh, a few of the other cloud providers have copied this, there's a cloud shell. And this is really popular with the SREs or, or admins for the cloud now, because they don't have to install anything on their laptop. They just log in with their browser, and they can click this button in the upper right-hand corner, and then a, a containerized environment gets deployed, and they can run all their commands from that containerized environment. Right? So that's, that's cool. Um, the first thing to note from an offensive standpoint, like let's say I steal someone's cookies and I'm somehow able to access the GCP environment, but it, it's not going to last long, right? So I want to persist some way. So, um, so I thought about this in the context of the cloud sh shell because I see this in use a lot now. And you'll see right there it says, your home directory will persist across sessions, right? From an attacker's standpoint, well, that sounds pretty great, right? You know? So, um, so what if, you know, we just make a slight modification to it, old school style, like we uh, dork the bash RC uh, to uh, load up our tool whenever uh, they, they load up this environment? Does that actually work? Can we get a callback out of the Cloud Shell environment? And yeah, the answer to that is, yeah, we get, we get a callback every time they click that button and the bash RC gets loaded to our LP where our, you know, red teaming software is at. And then, you know, from there, we, could, we have the same level of access that the admin does inside the cloud shell. Um, two minutes. Okay, so there's some really cool, uh, I don't know, Twitter chatter. Is that the right term? Uh, just on how to get outside of that shell, because that shell is kind of a container. Um, so I guess the, the root, uh, you can get to the root host below it just by running that command at the top. Um, so... Um, I did that, and from there, you can access the metadata service from the root host, um, but there's not really much you can access from there, so that's kind of mostly a dead end. Uh, but from a persistence standpoint, um, I did notice that you can store files uh, when you're on the host below that container uh, in slash temp, and they have a few other mount points that are writable, and um, those seem to persist at least for a, a moderate amount of time. So, um, so that, that's, that's kind of cool, maybe like a little bit of a covert store type system if, if you, know, you were using this in real life. All right, one minute left. Okay, last thing. Okay, so when, you go to, uh, when a pod goes to authenticate to the API or somebody else, what really happens on the hood? Um, you get authentication, auth n, then you get authorization, auth z, that kind of makes sure that you know, you're allowed to do what you're doing. And then there's this new thing called admission control, right? And what does admission control does? It does really useful things like validates that the, what you're trying to deploy inside the cluster um, isn't doing anything bad from a security standpoint. Um, but uh, like, for example, mounting the host's root file system and things like that. Um, 
But what uh, I noticed was there, you can have, because they didn't want to make you code everything inside of that, you can reach out to an external emission control. So let's imagine you get some type of privilege access inside the Kubernetes cluster, and you wrote a evil external emission control. You could mutate deployments as they move into the cluster. And uh, this is a newer thing. It's still alpha beta. So you may not see this in production, but uh, I, I definitely feel like this is the way the industry is moving. And uh, with that being said, I'm Bryce. Uh, if you want to talk more, I'll just be out hanging outside. I know I went through a lot quick, um, but uh, thank you guys for listening. So.